Chapter 66 Inheritance Murtai grinned. Then he said, Thirst of Ender, and a hard ball of air coalesced between them and struck Aragon in the middle of his chest, tossing him twenty feet across the plateau. Aragon heard Saphira growl as he landed on his back. His vision flashed red and white, then he curled into a ball and waited for the pain to recede. Any delight he felt in Murtag's reappearance was overwhelmed by the macabre circumstances of their meeting. An unstable mixture of shock, confusion, and anger boiled within him. Lowering his sword, Murtag pointed at Aragon with his steel-encased hand, curling every finger but his index into a spiny fist. You never would grow, give up. A chill crept along Aragon's spine, for he recognized the scene from his premonition while rafting in the Azragni to Hedarth. A man sprawled in the clotted mud with a dented helm and bloody mail, his face concealed behind an upthrown arm. An armored hand entered Aragon's view and pointed itself at the downed man with all the authority of fate itself. Past and future had converged. Now Aragon's doom would be decided. Pushing himself to his feet, he coughed and said, Murtag, how can you be alive? I watched the Urgles drag you underground. I tried to scry you, but saw only darkness. Murtag uttered a mirthless laugh. You saw nothing, just as I saw nothing the times I tried to scry you during my days in Urbane. You died, though, shouted Aragon, almost incoherent. You died under Farthendur. Arya found your bloody clothes in the tunnels. A shadow darkened Murtag's face. No, I did not die. It was the twins doing Aragon. They took control of a group of Urgles and arranged the ambush in order to kill Ajahad and capture me. Then they ensorcelled me, so I could not escape, and spirited me off to Urubain. Aragon shook his head, unable to comprehend what had happened. But why did you agree to serve Galbatorix? You told me you hated him. You told me— Agree! Murtag laughed again, and this time his outburst contained an edge of madness. I did not agree. First, Galbatorix punished me for spiting his years of protection during my upbringing in Urubain— for defying his will and running away. Then he extracted everything I knew about Sephira, you, and the Varden. You betrayed us. I was mourning you, and you betrayed us. I had no choice. Ajahad was right to lock you up. He should have let you rot in your cell. Then none of this— I had no choice, snarled Murtag. Then after Thorn hatched for me, Galbatorix forced both of us to swear loyalty to him and the ancient language— we cannot disobey him now. Pity and disgust welled inside of Aragon. You have become your father. A strange gleam leaped into Murtag's eyes. No, not my father. I'm stronger than Morzan ever was. Galbatorix thought, taught me things about magic you've never even dreamed of. Spells so powerful, the elves dare not utter them, cowards that they are. Words in the ancient language that were lost until Galbatorix discovered them. Ways to manipulate energy. Secrets, terrible secrets, that can destroy your enemies and fulfill all your dreams. Aragon thought back to some of Aromis's lessons and retorted, Things that re should remain secrets. If you knew, you would not say that. Brom was a dabbler, nothing more. And the elves? Bah! All they can do is hide in their forest and wait to be conquered. Murtag ran his eyes over Aragon. You look like an elf now. Did, did Islan's Zadi do that to you? When Aragon remained silent, Murtag smiled and shrugged. No matter. I'll learn the truth soon, soon enough. He stopped, frowned, then looked to the east. Following his gaze, Aragon saw the twins standing at the front of the Empire, casting balls of energy into the midst of the Varden and the dwarves. The curtains of smoke made it difficult to tell, but Aragon was sure the hairless magicians were grinning and laughing, as they slaughtered the men with whom they had once pledged solemn friendship. What the twins failed to notice, and what was clearly visible to Aragon and Murtag from their vantage point, was that Rorin was crawling toward them from the side. Aragon's heart skipped a beat as he recognized his cousin. You fool! Get away from them! You'll be killed! Just as he opened his mouth to cast a spell that would transport Rorin out of danger, no matter the cost, Murtag said, Wait! I want to see what he'll do. Why? A bleak smile crossed Murtag's face. 
The twins enjoyed tormenting me when I was their captive. Aragon glanced at him, suspicious. You won't hurt him? You won't warn the twins? The errada errai shergata. Upon my word as a rider. Together they watched as Roran hid behind a mound of bodies. Aragon stiffened as the twins looked toward the pile. For a moment, it seemed they had spotted him. Then they turned away, and Roran jumped up. He swung his hammer and bashed one of the twins in the head, cracking open his skull. The remaining twin fell to the ground, convulsing, and emitted a wordless scream until he too met his end under Roran's hammer. Then Roran planted his foot upon the corpses of his foes, lifted his hammer over his head, and bellowed his victory. "'What now?' demanded Aragon, turning away from the battlefield. "'Are you here to kill me?' "'Of course not. Galbatorix wants you alive.' "'What for?' Murtag's lips quirked. "'You don't know? Ha! There's a fine jest. It's not because of you. It's because of her.' He jabbed a finger at Sephira. "'The dragon inside Galbatorix's last egg, the last dragon egg in the world, is male. Sephira is the only female dragon in existence. If she breeds, she will become the mother of her entire race. Do you see now? Galbatorix doesn't want to eradicate the dragons.' He wants to use Sephira to rebuild the riders. He can't kill you, either of you, if his vision is to become reality. And what a vision it is, Aragon. You should hear him describe it. Then you might not think so badly of him. Is it evil that he wants to unite Allegasia under a single banner, eliminate the need for war, and restore the riders? He's the one who destroyed the riders in the first place. And for good reason, asserted Murtag. They were old, fat, and corrupt. The elves controlled them and used them to subjugate humans. They had to be removed so that we could start anew. A furious scowl contorted Aragon's features. He paced back and forth across the plateau, his breathing heavy, then gestured at the battle and said, How can you justify causing so much suffering on the basis of a madman's ravings? Galbatorix has done nothing but burn and slaughter and amass power for himself. He lies. He murders. He manipulates. You know this. It's why you refused to work with him in the first place. Aragon paused, then adopted a gentler tone. I can understand that you were compelled to act against your will, and that you weren't responsible for killing Hrothgar. You can try to escape, though. I'm sure that Arya and I could devise a way to neutralize the bonds Galbatorix has laid upon you. Join me, Murtag. You could do so much for the Varden. With us, you would be praised and admired instead of cursed, feared, and hated. For a moment, as Murtag gazed down at his notched sword, Aragon hoped he would accept. Then Murtag said in a low voice, You cannot help me, Aragon. No one but Galbatorix can release us from our oaths, and he will never do that. He knows our true names, Aragon. We are his slaves forever. Though he wanted to, Aragon could not deny the sympathy he felt for Murtag's plight. With the utmost gravity, he said, Then let us kill the two of you. Kill us? Why should we allow that? Aragon chose his words with care. It would free you from Galbatorix's control, and it would save the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Isn't that a noble enough cause to sacrifice yourself for? Murtag shook his head. Maybe for you, but life is still, still too sweet for me to part with so easily. No stranger's life is more important than Thorn's or my own. As much as he hated it, hated the entire situation, in fact, Aragon knew then what had to be done. Renewing his attack on Murtag's mind, he leaped forward, both feet leaving the ground as he lunged toward Murtag, intending to stab him through the heart. Letta! barked Murtag. Aragon dropped back to the ground as invisible bands clamped around his arms and legs, immobilizing him. To his right, Saphira discharged a jet of rippling fire and sprang at Murtag like a cat pouncing on a mouse. Risa, commanded Murtag, extending a claw-like hand as if to catch her. Saphira yelped with surprise as Murtag's incantation stopped her in midair and held her in place, floating several feet above the plateau. No matter how much she wriggled, she could not touch the ground, nor could she fly any higher. How can he still be human and have the strength to do, to do that? wondered Aragon. Even with my new abilities, such a task would leave me gasping for air and unable to walk. 
relying upon his experience counteracting Aromas' spells, Aragon said, Braco du vanala sem huda safira un eka. Murtag made no attempt to stop him, only gave him a flat stare, as if he found Aragon's resistance a pointless inconvenience. Baring his teeth, Aragon redoubled his efforts. His hands went cold, his bones ached, and his pulse slowed as the magic sapped his energy. Without being asked, Saphira joined forces with him, granting him access to the formidable resources of her own body. Five seconds passed. Twenty seconds. A thick vein pulsed on Murtag's neck. A minute. A minute and a half. Involuntary tremors racked Aragon. His quadriceps and hamstrings fluttered, and his legs would have given way if he were free to move. Two minutes passed. At last, Aragon was forced to release the magic, else he ri risked falling unconscious and passing into the void. He sagged, utterly spent. He had been afraid before, but only because he thought he might fail. Now he was afraid because he did not know what Murtag was capable of. "'You cannot hope to compete with me,' said Murtag. "'No one can, except for Galbatorix.' Walking up to Aragon, he pointed his sword at Aragon's neck pricking his skin. Aragon resisted the impulse to flinch. It would be so easy to take you back to Ur Urubane. Aragon gazed deep into his eyes. Don't let me go. You just tried to kill me, and you would have done the same in my position. When Murtag remained silent and expressionless, Aragon said, We were friends once. We fought together. Galbatorix can't have twisted you so much that you've forgotten. If you do this, Murtag, you'll be lost forever. A long minute passed where the only sound was the hue and cry of the clashing armies. Blood trickled down Aragon's neck from where the sword point cut him. Saphira lashed her tail with helpless rage. Finally, Murtag said, I was ordered to try and capture you and Saphira. He paused. I have tried. Make sure we don't cross paths again. Galbatorix will have me swear additional oaths in the ancient language that will prevent me from showing you such mercy when we next meet. He lowered his sword. You're doing the right thing, said Aragon. He tried to step back, but was still held in place. Perhaps, but before I let you go. Reaching out, Murtag pried Zorak from Aragon's fist and unbuckled Zorak's red sheath from the belt of Baloth the Wise. If I have become my father... Then I will have my father's blade. Thorn is my dragon, and a thorn he shall be to all our enemies. It is only right, then, that I should also wield the sword Misery. Misery and Thorn, a fit match. Besides, Zorak should have gone to Morzan's eldest son, not his youngest. It is mine by right of birth. A cold pit formed in Aragon's stomach. It can't be. A cruel smile appeared on Murtag's face. I never told you my mother's name, did I? And you never told me yours. I'll say it now. Selina. Selina was my mother and your mother. Morzan was our father. The twins figured out the connection while they were digging around in your head. Galbatorix was quite interested to learn that particular piece of information. You're lying, cried Aragon. He could not bear this thought of being Morzan's son. Did Brom know? Does Aromas know? Why didn't they tell me? He remembered then, Angela predicting that someone in his family would betray him. She was right. Murtag merely shook his head and repeated his words in the ancient language, then put his lips to Aragon's ear and whispered, You and I, we are the same, Aragon. Mirror images of one another. You can't deny it. You're wrong, growled Aragon, struggling against the spell. We're nothing alike. I don't have a scar on my back anymore. Murtag recoiled as if he had been stung, his face going hard and cold. He lifted Zorak and held it upright before his chest. So be it. I take my inheritance from you, brother. Farewell. Then he retrieved his helm from the ground and pulled himself onto Thorn. Not once did he look at Aragon as the dragon crouched, raised its wings, and flew off the plateau and into the north. Only after Thorn vanished below the horizon did the web of magic release Aragon and Saphira. Saphira's talons clicked on the stone as she landed. 
She crawled over to Aragon and touched him on the arm with her snout. Are you all right, little one? I'm fine. But he was not, and she knew it. Walking to the edge of the, of the plateau, Aragon surveyed the burning plains and the aftermath of the battle, for the battle was over. With the death of the twins, the Varden and dwarves regained lost ground and were able to rout the formations of confused soldiers, herding them into the river or chasing them back from whence they had come. Though the bulk of their forces remained intact, the Empire had sounded the retreat, no doubt to regroup and prepare for a second attempt to invade Serta. In their wake, they left piles of tangled corpses from both sides of the conflict, enough men and dwarves to populate an entire city. Thick black smoke roiled off the bodies that had fallen into the peat fires. Now that the fighting had subsided, the hawks and eagles, the crows and ravens, descended like a shroud over the field. Aragon closed his eyes, tears leaking from under the lids. They had won, but he had lost.